God loves everybody. He loves the worst sinners. But He doesn't love the sin. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank You for the opportunity we have of giving the gospel. We thank You now as we do give that we receive a great harvest as You promised. In the name of Jesus, Mr. Devil, take your hands off of our harvest. We are blessed of God to be a greater blessing in the future. We thank you for this now in the name of Jesus. And all as the love of the Lord said, Amen. Amen. Please stand up, let's pray, let's get right to the word here this morning. And if there are people here this morning that have had abortions done, I know that God will forgive you because you have asked Him to do so. And He has forgiven you and you are forgiven like you never ever did it. And uh, whatever sin we have committed in the past is washed clean by the blood. Our sin has has gone as far as from the east as from the west, never to remember no more. God doesn't even remember the sins we committed because we are forgiven. Amen? Amen. All right. And everybody that lives in sin can be forgiven by God. He's a merciful God. All right. Dear Father, we stand before you now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this wonderful day. We come to teach the word. I make it known that I'm not trusting or depending on limited human ability to teach, but I am trusting in you. Therefore, I know without doubt that you anoint my mind, that I might grasp the revelation that will rise in abundance from my heart within. Thank you for a supernatural recall of the Scripture. And I believe that your word will flow from our mouth smoothly, accurately, clearly, without hindrance or anything, carried by your anointing, your power, and your love to each person's mind, bring understanding and I believe that you will enter every heart, bringing faith, removing all confusion, and all doubt, and all fear, in Jesus' name. And we give you all the praise and the glory for all that's revealed and accomplished through your word and by our spirit here today, in Jesus' name. And all those who love the Lord said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. The message for this day is titled... The weapons of our warfare. Say that, the weapons of our warfare. The atmosphere around us is full of hostile forces, demonic spirits that are arrayed against us. But God has not abandoned us. He has equipped us with weapons to deal with this. Now, two weeks ago, I taught a message titled, the power of the renewed mind. So what we're learning today is all part of the process of renewing the mind. We do need to understand something about the weapons of our warfare if we plan to renew our thinking and live successfully on the earth. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. The Bible says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. All right, so take your pen and underline the word our. Underline the word our in your Bible. The weapons of our warfare, it's not God's warfare, it's ours. Jesus has done everything he's ever going to do about the devil. He's not going to chase him for us. The next time Jesus does anything to the devil, it's going to throw him in the bottomless pit after the tribulation period. He'll be there for a thousand years during the reign of Christ on the earth. But Jesus is not going to stop the devil for you or me. Don't pray and ask God to do it. He's not going to. Because Jesus said, well, the Bible said in James 4, 7, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. You resist the devil and he will flee as in terror from you. So you resist him in the name of Jesus and he will flee. Amen. Bible said in Matthew, uh, in Mark 16, 17, 18, the believer will cast out demons. Didn't say Jesus will do it. Jesus is not going to cast the demons out. You have to. So it's our warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not natural, not carnal, but mighty in God. They are God's weapons. Say that my weapons that I use to defend myself are God's weapons. Praise God. One of those weapons is the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Now, before we get on to talking about the name of Jesus, I'd like to give you three scriptures to show you and prove to you that the devil is in control of the unsaved. The unsaved. 
and that He's therefore controlling the activities of the earth, unless we pray. The first one, and there's several, I'm only going to choose three, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. It says, whose minds, whose minds, the God of this age is blinded. All right? So it says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of people. Now, the Father God doesn't blind the minds of anybody. That's obviously talking about the devil. And calls him the God of this age. The God of this age. Blinded the minds of those who don't believe, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So the Bible says that Satan stops them from understanding the gospel and getting saved. All right, that's the first scripture to prove that we have, that the devil controls the unsaved and is God of this world. Now, if the devil's controlling their thinking, then when we come to witness to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, we need to bind the demons that are controlling their thoughts before we witness to them. Otherwise, they're not going to understand the one thing you say. Go to 1 John 5, 19. 1 John 5, 19. Now we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. All right? So this, I am a child of God, and the whole world, the unsaved world, are under the influence of the wicked one, the devil. So the unsaved are controlled and influenced, manipulated by demons, like a puppet master. Ephesians 2, verse 2, third scripture. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So there was a time before we were born again that we lived like the world that was controlled by the prince of the power of the air. So when we were unsaved, we were also, like the rest of the world, controlled by the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? That's the devil. And notice he's the prince of the power of the air, the atmosphere. That's where these demons exist or live, operate. The spirit, that, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So Satan is at work in the hearts of the unsaved. So we can see clearly once more that the devil is in control of the unsaved. There's the three scriptures I said I'd give you. Now, as I said, the atmosphere around us is full of hostile forces trying to discourage us, trying to tell us that we are failures 24-7. The devil's going to try his best to tell you it's not going to work, what you believe him for is not going to happen, you're a failure, you don't have the right to believe God because you're no good, and God's not going to hear your prayers because you're not perfect, and of course, the devil thinks he's perfect. We know he's not, right? No, we have authority to shut the devil up. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father has given us the name of Jesus to use as a mighty weapon in our combat against these demonic spirits. A mighty weapon. Jesus said, we will cast out demons by using His name in Mark 16 and verse 17. Jesus said, these signs will follow those who believe. How many of you are believers here this morning? Amen. All right. Say, these signs follow me. Jesus said, in my name they will cast out demons. Now, Jesus said, in my name they will cast out demons. So we cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Now, you can, you can command the devil anywhere and he will immediately obey you. But if he's in somebody, possessing somebody, then you can't cast the demon out without that person's permission. Right? Without his permission. So, um, because he might have opened the door for a demon to come in. That's why. 
and they might want to continue doing that thing that they're doing wrong, that they know they're doing wrong. So the devil won't listen to you if that person gives you permission, gives them permission for the devil to stay in them. Because you and I have authority over the demons, but we don't have authority over other people's wills. We are all free moral agents. We are not robots. God doesn't even command uh, or doesn't take over us and, and use us like a robot unless we're willing for him to do so. He'll order the steps. He'll order the steps of those who are willing to be directed by the Lord. So say this, Father God, I give you permission to direct me and order my steps. See, so now God will guide us. But he, if you say, well, I don't want God to guide me, then he won't. He won't. He won't even try. You see that? That's how it works. Because we are free moral agents. So I can cast demons out of anybody if they give me permission to do so. And they close the door. So can you. She said, every believer will do that. All right. He also said we can bind demons in the atmosphere. Here in Matthew 18, 18. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, what you allow on earth, heaven will back you up. Whatever you do not allow on earth, heaven will back you up. In other words, the angels and the demons are all subject to the words from your mouth when you use the name of Jesus. Now, how much power is in the name of Jesus? I wonder, how much power and authority does that name actually have? Let's find out. Go to Hebrews 1 verse 3, please. Hebrews 1 verse 3. When Christ had by himself purged our sins, when Christ had by himself paid for our sins on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He rose from the dead and went to heaven and sat down on the right hand of God. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than the angels. So, after rising from the dead, he sat down at the right hand of God and God gave him a name above every name. A more excellent name than the angels. Now the angels are mighty, especially the archangels, like Gabriel and like Michael. Michael being the great angel of war who cast Satan out of heaven. And uh, Michael uh, and, and, and Gabriel, the great messenger who takes the special messengers to, say, like Mary... And to um, whoever. So these angels have great names, but Jesus has a greater name. Philippians 2 8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus left heaven, or Christ left heaven after creating the worlds, left the right hand of God, came down to earth, slipped inside a human body provided by Mary, walked the earth and was known as Jesus. He was the Christ living in a human body known as Jesus. The creator of all things living in a human body known as Jesus. The name given for his humanity. Then it says, he became found in appearance as a man, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. Gave him the name which is above every name. Now, if the Bible had said gave him a name which is above every name, that would mean God gave him a name that's greater the name of any other name. But when God says gave him the name, that tells us that there was a name kept in store in eternity past, 
waiting for someone to inherit it. Christ inherited the name that was kept in store. That's greater than any other name. Therefore God has highly exalted him, given him the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee should bow. In heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth. Just, there's, just in case there's any confusion about who would bow, God clears that up and he says, everybody. Those in heaven, those on earth, and those in hell. Everything will bow before the name of Jesus. So the sickness will bow when I use the name of Jesus. Lack will bow when I use the name of Jesus. Circumstances will change when I use the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow. Satan will bow when I use the name of Jesus. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, once the rapture takes place here on earth, very soon, we'll go up to heaven. The bride will be married to the groom, Christ Jesus. And we will receive our rewards and be judged by Jesus during that period of time. We'll come back with him and rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. And then after a thousand years, the great white throne judgment will take place. Where Satan will be judged, all demons, all angels, and all the unsaved that are alive will be judged. And all those that are in Hades will rise from Hades come out of punishment, go stand before God and be judged. And that's when they will all confess, including the devil, Lucifer, Satan, that Jesus Christ is Lord. They will all acknowledge, every living thing will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those that blaspheme his name today will quiver and shake before God and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord on that glorious day. You and I will watch that happen, but we will not be judged then. Praise God. Now say this, please. All that Christ is, Christ is. is in that name. Say this, all that Christ has accomplished is in that name. All that Christ can do is in that name. All His strength and authority is in that name. All authority in heaven and on earth is in that name. That's what you are releasing when you use the name of Jesus. And that's what the devil has to contend with when you speak that name to him. I have a question for you, please. Can anyone show me a place in the Bible where the Lord Jesus has ever used his own name? For the 33 years that he was on the earth, in his earthly ministry, did he ever use his own name to command anything? No. I command this in my name. No. In the approximately 2,000 years since the resurrection, 
Can you show me any scripture in the Bible where Jesus said, from the right hand of God, I command this in my name? No, he never did. Jesus has never used that great name. So we have to ask the question, why did God give him that great name if he's not using it? When you go to a bank, you sign your name. If you want to draw some money out or you use your name. If you want credit. It's your good name that grants you the credit. But Jesus didn't use it. Never has. Does Jesus not need that name to manage and run the universe which he created? All creation was spoken into existence from his words. And all creation continues to operate as designed and instructed. He maintains it through his words. Let's have a look and see if we can prove that in the Bible. Hebrews 1 verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in his last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. So this God appointed Christ, the heir, to inherit everything. Now, that's wonderful, isn't it? That Christ inherited everything. The Bible says, all things were made by Him, for Him. For Him. That means us too. But the Bible also tells us, in Romans chapter 8, and verse 17, that we are co-heirs with Christ, that we have inherited everything Christ has inherited. We have inherited everything that Christ has inherited with Him. Isn't that amazing? How rich we are. How blessed we are. We need to renew our mind with that. Take out the stinking thinking and replace it with what God says about you. Confess that. I am a co-heir with Christ. All that He has inherited, I have inherited. I am what the Bible says I am. Amen? Amen. Let's create that psychology. Let's create that awareness. Verse 2 again. He has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, in whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person, and up, watch this now, and upholding all things by the word of His power. Now that didn't say He created all things, although He did. It says He's upholding all things. That means He's keeping all things in order. Functioning as designed. In other words, he is the life source of all things in existence. And how does he keep it and maintain it in good work in order? By the word of his power. By the word of his power. Or by the power of his word. So say this, God, Jesus Christ, Christ. created all things Christ. by his words and maintains all things by His Word, not His name. He's not using His name in any of this. It's just His Word that's sufficient. When He had by Himself purged our sin, sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. Everything you can see is made of atoms, right? Which are made up of protons and neutrons, electrons. 
And these tiny particles are always moving. They never stop. They're always moving. Where does that life source come from? It baffles the scientists. Where does that energy come from? It comes from Christ. That pole is existing because of the source of its life, its alive, is coming from Christ. Everything in existence is in existence by Christ, because of Christ. Right now, His Word maintains it all, not His name, not His name. Jesus has a wonderful name, but He doesn't need it to run the universe or maintain it. No, Jesus earned the greatness of that name, not for His benefit, but for our benefit. For our benefit. In all eternity, there is no hero like Christ. Left his throne in heaven, came to the earth, received a human body to become our substitute, be punished in our place, go to hell in our place, rise from the dead. And in the process of rising from the dead, he conquered Satan and demons, took away Satan's authority over us, transferred us out of Satan's kingdom of slavery into Christ's kingdom, kingdom of freedom, given us eternal life all in one moment at the resurrection. What a great accomplishment. The suffering on the cross and the suffering in the fires of hell for three days. He took that and earned the great name that was waiting to be inherited. All of that for you and me. There is no hero like Jesus in all of eternity. There is no hero like Jesus. How grateful we are to our Lord and Savior for His love and mercy and the price he paid. And yet somebody can curse his name and blaspheme his name. It's just like a knife in my heart when I hear that. John 16, 23, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. So here we see Jesus talking to his disciples when he's on the earth. And he said to them, if you'll read John 16, the previous part of that chapter, he said, now look, he said, I'm going to go to heaven, I'm dying, I'm going to rise and go to heaven. And he says, when I'm gone on that day, you will ask me for nothing. He says, right now, you ask me whatever you want, I'll give it to you. I feed you five loaves and a few fish, all that stuff. But when I'm gone... You won't ask me anything anymore because I'm not here. You're going to ask the Father and use my name. And when you ask the Father for it in my name, He's going to give it to you. He said, whatever. Most assuredly, it's this way, no other way. I say to you, whatever you ask, whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give you. Say this. Jesus gave me power of attorney to use his name. And he put that power of attorney in his will at his death. So this, the New Testament is the will and testament of Jesus Christ. And he's risen from the dead to make sure that his will and testament is upheld. Praise God. He said in the will, I have power of attorney to use his name. Which means, when I ask God for something in prayer and use his name, it's just as if Jesus himself prayed the prayer and asked for that thing. There's no difference. If Jesus were to pray and ask God for that thing that you pray and ask God for using His name, it's no difference. 
Whatever you ask the Father for, use His name. It's just like Jesus praying the prayer for you. Just like Jesus praying the prayer for you. Amen? That's a legal document. Now then. 24. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Because I've helped you. I've done everything you wanted. But ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So that's talking about prayer. That's talking about prayer. Praying to God. Now in the next verse we're going to read, John 14. Here the Lord's talking about ministry. You ministering. All of us are called to ministry. Some full time, some voluntarily. But you're called to ministry. In some way or another, you have something to contribute to move the ball forward for the kingdom of Christ. You call to do something, big or small, is not important. What is important is that you do what He asks. You'll be rewarded for what He asks you to do. If, it's to sweep, if He says sweep the church, you'll be rewarded just like anybody else who conquers the greatest mountain in the world, whatever it might be. Because you're doing what God told you to do, that's what's important. Well done, good and faithful servant. All right? Now, so, now, we're talking about ministry here. Watch this. Most assuredly I'll say to you, he who believes in me, that's you and me, right? Are you a believer? The works that I do, he will do also. It's talking about works. What works are that? Raising the dead, casting out demons, healing the sick, open blind eyes, preaching the gospel. That's the works he did. He said, the works that I do, you will do also. And greater works than these you will do. The greater works, that's not talking about quality, it's talking about quantity, because there's more of us. The greater works than these will you do. Why? Because I go to my Father and... What if you command in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son? He says, if you command anything in my name, I'll do it. I'll do it. Talking about ministry. You cast out demons. You do this, you do that. To minister, to carry on the ministry of Jesus. Command circumstances to change. Command finances to come. Command lack to go. Amen? Because you need to succeed in life so you can be a witness for Christ. Now then, whatever you command in my name, that I'll do the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you command anything in my name, I will do it. And anything means anything. Anything means anything because that's what anything means. All right? Now, John 15, 7. If you abide in me, that means if you fellowship with me, and my words abide in you, if you meditate on my word, you will command what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Say this, I can command my desires to come to pass. Not only my needs. Now, the name of Jesus represents Jesus whenever we use it. Say that, the name of Jesus represents Jesus. When I use that name, Jesus manifests, and He does it. Jesus will perform the same miracles and cast out demons today, just like He did when He was on the earth, when I use His name. So that when I use the name of Jesus, Jesus will cast out demons, heal the sick, calm the stormy sea, Today, when I use that name, just like he did when he was on the earth. Say this, when I use the name of Jesus against sickness, disease, financial lack, circumstances, and demon spirits, when I use the name of Jesus against those enemies, it is. As if Jesus himself gave the command. Amen. 
Say it again. When I use the name of Jesus and command circumstances, it's as if Jesus himself gave the command. What are we doing here? We are renewing our mind. I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that message on the renewing of the mind. We are renewing our mind with the Word of God. Now, you have a choice. You can walk out here and say, great message, and forget it. It'll stay up here. But if you go back and listen to this this DVD, or go online and listen on demand, because it's going to be it's going to be on our website and it's going to be on YouTube and Facebook. You can listen to it over and over and over, and you can renew your mind and listen to it until that goes down into your heart. Now, once that gets into your heart, you are going to rise up and walk in this victory, and you'll see circumstances change. Because the greater your mind is renewed, the greater your victories in life. Are you tracking me, church? Now, so Jesus has never used his name, but he's clearly given us authority to do so. Let's go to Ephesians 1, verse 19. Just in case anybody is still hesitant in stepping out and being and using all this authority, we've been driving the nail through the board and we're going to clinch it on the other side of the plank. You know what that means? Have you ever done that? When I was a kid, I used to do that. Hit the nail through the two pieces of wood, and when it gets to the other side, you hit it with the hammer and you bend it over, and now it's not going to come out. We're going to do that right now spiritually. You ready? If you found Ephesians 1.19, I'm reading for the New Living Translation. I pray that you will begin to understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in Him. All right? Paul's writing this letter to the church at Ephesus, but he's inspired by the Spirit of God. So it's the Holy Ghost writing this letter letter. You got it? And he says, I'm praying that you'll understand how much power there is available to the believer. Now you've got to listen to this very carefully. God is praying that you and I will understand how much power we have available now in this world. And he says, this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in heavenly places. The power that God used, the energy that God exerted to raise Christ from the dead is the power available to you and me right now. That's what he just got through saying. So how much power was used to raise Christ from the dead? Well, when God raised Christ from the dead, you and I were raised from the dead in Christ at the same time. Every person ever born and will be born has been raised from death into new life, the born-again experience, paid for at the resurrection of Christ. The unsaved out there They are raised from the dead, paid for by Christ. They haven't accepted the gift, but it's theirs, paid for. God's not going to die and rise again for them. He's done it already. When Christ raised from the dead, he conquered Satan and demons, totally defeated him. The devil had not, had no idea when he crucified Jesus that he was actually crucifying himself. Because in doing so, he lost all his authority over the church. And we were transferred out of his kingdom. Colossians 1.13, into the kingdom of Christ. 
We are no longer slaves to the master Satan. We are in Christ's kingdom. He is our new master and Lord, and we are masters of the devil. We rule and reign over, Christ, over the devil. We are his master now. All that paid for at the resurrection. The greatest release of God's energy and power in all of eternity past and eternity in the future was the resurrection. When Joshua turned to the sun and commanded the sun and the moon to stop in the sky, and the earth turning at a thousand miles an hour stopped dead, and no one even knew it, on the earth they didn't even feel it. That was a great miracle, but it's nothing in comparison to the energy and power of Christ and God released at the resurrection. That's the power God says is available to you and me down here to fight our warfare. Verse 21. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else in this world or in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and gave Christ this authority for the benefit of the church. So all that God gave Christ, He gave to Him for your and my benefit. For the benefit of the church. Why is that necessary? Well, because, child of God, this is the battle zone down here. It's God's dream to have a family in heaven for eternity. It's God's plan. The most important thing on, in God's agenda is an eternal family. He's planned that from eternity past. Eternity past. And right now on this planet are more living souls than are in hell and heaven combined at the moment. And this is God's hope, these people, that they'll come to heaven. This is what God lives for. I almost want to say what He breathes for, but He doesn't breathe. This is what God lives for. This is His dream, a family in heaven. The people on the earth, which He died for, that He loved so much. He so loved the world that He died for them. And he knows that Satan wants to stop his dream and will stop at nothing and use every evil trick in the book to take souls to hell, to deceive them. But God in His great mercy has given us unlimited power, authority, and weapons in our arsenal in Ephesians chapter 6, the weapons of our warfare. And above all of that is the name of Jesus, the greatest authority anywhere. And all the power in the universe and all the authority in the universe is wrapped up in that one name, which you have the legal right to use to stop the devil from harassing the unsaved, command him to leave them, claim their salvation, command circumstances to change, command lack to go, finances to come, sickness to go, health to come. And the more we understand the subject, the more this gets into our spirit, the more we'll see ourselves walking in this dimension and this victory. This is not going to happen by head knowledge. It's going to happen by heart knowledge. It's not difficult. Meditate on it. Meditate on it. I have been meditating on scriptures. I took out all the scriptures in the Bible where somebody was raised from the dead. And I've been reading them. 
Because I know pretty soon I sense in my heart I'm going to have to raise somebody from the dead. So I'm preparing myself before it happens. Meditating, 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 meditating. There's no other way. There's no other way. You meditate on something long enough, you're going to walk in it. There's no other way. I'm just telling you how it works. You may tell what I'm talking about here now, and you'll see the power of God moving your life like you can't even imagine. Because Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above, you can, above what you can even ask or think or imagine. Your imagination is not big enough to know what God can do through you. By the power of God that's available in you right now. That's what the verse says. So child of God, he has not left you. He's not abandoned you. The demonic spirits are trying to destroy you and discourage you. No, he's put you in charge. Let's renew our thinking to that. Let's wake up to that. Let's accept it and walk in it. It's the end times now. It's time for the bride to rise and shine. And let his glory be seen in the earth. Amen. God loves you all. You are his prize and his joy. The devil telling you, no good sinner, you've messed up. Yes, we're all messed up. The only one that isn't is Jesus. No, no perfect ones among us, but his grace is sufficient. Just get up and keep on going. All right? Are you with me? Praise God. You glad you came to church? Let's give Jesus some praise in the house. <laughs> praise the Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. How many would say, Apostle Thea, I want to be sure I go to heaven one day. I don't want to die and wake up in the fires of hell. Can you please help me? Yes, I can. While heads are bowed, while eyes are closed. While heads are bowed and while eyes are closed. If you want to be sure you're going to heaven one day. I'm going to pray a little prayer right now. And God's going to speak to you right in your heart and let you know. That you are his child. And that you will go to heaven. Your sins are forgiven. If you want God to speak to you and confirm that in your heart, when I count to three, if you'll slip your hand up, that'll indicate to God that you invite Him to speak to you when I pray. And He will. Are you ready? So I'm going to count before I pray. Here we go. One, two, three. Thank you. I invite everybody to say this prayer with me, please. Dear God in heaven, all of you watching live, let's say the prayer. Dear God in heaven, Thank you for sending Jesus. He died on the cross in my place. He was punished for my sins that I might be forgiven. I ask you, Jesus, please forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. Save my life. Thank you, Lord. I declare Jesus is my Savior. And today, He is my Lord. And I am now forgiven. God is now my Father, and now I'm bound for heaven. Praise God, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. I love you, Jesus. Amen. I want to congratulate all of you that accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. And we'll see you in heaven. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, just as we close, a little reminder that on uh, October 31, Saturday night, three weeks away, we're going to be having our fall festival directly after the 6 p.m. service. We have hay bale rides, candy, music, outdoor grills, fire pits with s'mores, and games for kids. And all are welcome. Please invite folks to church so they can come get saved and then come afterwards and enjoy some time of fellowship with us at the fall festival. Now, we were planning to have some cards ready to hand out so you can write down the names of those folks you are praying for and put them on your little card to remind you to pray for them. 
Unfortunately, the princess didn't have the cards ready in time, but they will be here next weekend. In the meantime, start thinking about who you're going to invite and start praying for them. And remember, we're going to pray for them together. We're going to bind the devil and the demons from harassing their thinking before you invite them so that they will respond favorably when you do invite them, okay? All right. Raise your right hand and say, Father, I thank you for the angels that camp around me and my family to protect us in all of our ways as you promised in Psalm 91. And I thank you, Father, that as I come to church, I am learning more about God. And when I join the fellowship group, I am walking in my freedom. When I attend growth track, I find out what my destiny is, my purpose of God. And when I join the dream team, I make a difference in the lives of others. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Also, Wednesday night this week, Ed Trout will be speaking right here and ministering to us, okay? Ed Trout, praise God. We love you all. See you next weekend. Have a great week.